Welcome back to the Manly Saints Project. By me, Hugh Hunter. We live in a world that struggles to understand the virtues of manliness. Our culture doesn't provide young men, or any men for that matter, with a lot of positive male role models. When I became a Catholic, I wanted to show how the saints could be manly role models for us. My weekly exploration of manly saints became the Manly Saints Project. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the links in the show notes to buy me a beer. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today as we learn how an apparently chance encounter turned a decent man into a saint. Name, Basilides. Lived. Well, he died very early in the 3rd century AD. Status, saint. Feast, June 30th. The trial was a mockery of justice. The extraordinarily beautiful girl, Potamiena, and her mother, Marcella, were being examined by the governor of the Roman province of Egypt at his headquarters in Alexandria. The official reason was because they were Christians, but everyone knew that wasn't really what the trial was about. What it was really about was that Potamiena had refused to have sex with a rich man. The rich man had used his connections and his wealth and the fact that Potamiena and Marcella really were Christians to get them caught up in the latest anti-Christian persecution. The way the rich man imagined it, Potamiena would be shown the instruments of torture and would be so scared that she'd do whatever he asked. It wasn't working out that way. Potamiena was standing her ground. She had already been tortured once, and she remained defiant. The trial took place in Roman Alexandria in the opening years of the 3rd century AD. It was the sort of corruption you might see in such a vast city, where half a million Greeks, Egyptians, and Jews lived together under Roman rule. Commerce had made the city rich. Merchants came and went from the harbor, exporting Egyptian produce and importing goods from all over the empire, guided by the towering lighthouse, a wonder of the ancient world. The back streets of Alexandria were the environment in which our manly saint Basilides lived. From his Greek name, we can guess that he was very likely born in Alexandria, joining the Roman army through a local recruiter. Basilides was a pagan. He would have worshipped the meld of Roman and Egyptian deities honored in Alexandria. Perhaps, like many soldiers at the time, he was also initiated into the worship of the Persian god Mithras. Basilides may well have spent his whole career as a soldier in Egypt, but he would have had combat experience, since he had been promoted at least to the level of a junior officer. There is really no reason to think that Basilides was particularly unusual in any way until the day he encountered Potamiana. Basilides was probably dimly aware that Alexandria had its fair share of Christians. From a pagan point of view, though, Christians were one religious group among many. Alexandria had plenty of priests and temples. It also contained secretive groups that required special initiation, like the Mithras cult. And then there were the philosophers. Pagan philosophy was drawing toward the end of the phase that we call Middle Platonism, and thinkers like Ammonius Saccas taught in Alexandria. His students rubbed shoulders with those of the Christian Clement of Alexandria, who taught that Just as the Torah had prepared the Jews for the coming of the Messiah, philosophy had been God's preparation for the Greeks. Even among self-described Christians, there were many voices, as Orthodox Christians contended against Marcionites and other Gnostics, who argued that the Old and New Testaments described the work of two different gods. The man leading the Orthodox Christians was the bishop and future saint Demetrius. Demetrius had spent almost 50 years as an illiterate farmer, living a life of quiet holiness. And then one day, his predecessor had dreamed of an angel who said that the next bishop of Alexandria would be the man who gave him grapes, even though it was the wrong time of year for grapes. 
the very next day, Demetrius the farmer showed up, looking for a blessing and bringing the bishop a gift of grapes that he had somehow been able to grow. The bishop took Demetrius by the hand and proclaimed that this illiterate farmer would be his successor. I imagine that many people were worried about the elevation of Demetrius. They didn't need to worry for long. Demetrius easily learned to read and write. He proved to be an eloquent speaker and an effective administrator. Under his influence, the church in Alexandria grew, even under persecution. Almost everything went well. But perhaps every saint needs a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Bishop Demetrius's thorn had a name. Origen. The last character in the story of how Basilides became a saint is the philosopher and theologian Origen. Origen was a truly extraordinary thinker, a genius who simultaneously impressed, baffled, and worried Bishop Demetrius and thinking Christians for the next 1800 years. Origen is a church father, but he is not a saint. He taught speculatively about areas in which there was not a developed theology, and his speculations were bold, some would say too bold. Because of his murky legacy, most of the 320 books he wrote, yes, you heard that number correctly, were not preserved. But it seems to me that Benedict XVI was right when he said of Origen that he was, quote, not only a brilliant theologian, but also an exemplary witness of the doctrine he passed on, unquote. No one ever denied that Origen was brilliant. It's the only way to explain his rise to prominence in Alexandria. Origen's father was a Roman citizen who married a non-citizen, meaning that Origen did not inherit citizenship. His father had a collection of books, and young Origen read them eagerly, learning the literature and style of the Greek Renaissance we call the Second Sophistic. Soon Origen wanted real conversation and he was soaking up teachings from the pagan, Gnostic, and Christian thinkers in Alexandria. He sounded like a young philosopher, and tried to dress like one, too. Nowadays, smart people are supposed to look messy, like Einstein, or casual cool, like Steve Jobs. At the time, the stereotype of a philosopher was someone who lived with few possessions, barefoot with just a cloak. So that is what Origen did. It helped that his family didn't have a lot of money. Then, in 202 AD, the Roman emperor, Septimus Severus, made a decision that brought together all the strands of our story. He decided to crack down on Christians throughout the empire. Now, this was a minor persecution compared to what was coming in the next few centuries. Septimus Severus only targeted Roman citizens. If non-citizens wanted to be Christians, he didn't care. Messengers brought the emperor's order to the far corners of the empire and in Alexandria, they were enthusiastically enforced. Origen came from a family of Christians. Since he and his mother were not citizens, they were safe, but Origen's father was not safe, and he was taken away and executed. Origen was almost 17. The martyrdom of his father changed the young man in a profound way. He got serious. For the rest of his life, he would yearn to follow his father as a martyr, although he would not be successful in this. It wasn't for lack of trying. When everyone else was afraid to be seen with the arrested Christians, Origen went into the prisons to speak with them, console them, and encourage them as they faced the martyrdom he so desired. He thought he would be swept up in the persecution and martyred too. But what happened instead is that Origen revealed his remarkable gifts as a teacher. When he was just 18 years old, Bishop Demetrius had no choice but to make him an official teacher in the Christian school of Alexandria. The small income he got also allowed Origen, who now had to support his mother, to devote himself to helping the church in Alexandria full-time. You can probably imagine how this story was going to play out. The fearless and brilliant young Origen was going to come into conflict with the cautious administrator Demetrius. Over the years, the two of them would clash again and again, culminating in Origen's exile from Alexandria. 
After Origen died, Christian thinkers would take sides over his writings. Those who did not like Origen would translate them in ways to make them seem outrageous, while those who did would translate them to edit out awkward parts of Origen's legacy. As scholar Joseph Trigg points out, the pro- and anti-Origen camps that formed soon after his death have basically never changed. But that was all in the future. In our story, Origen is still an earnest young man, building his reputation, and the future conflicts are like a line of dark clouds far away on the horizon. Maybe in happier times, Potamiena and her mother Marcella had even studied at the Christian school where Origen taught. Now, Potamiena had been caught up in this show trial because she refused to have sex with a rich man. When the governor threatened her with torture, it didn't dent her resolve. After the first round of torture, Potamiena was still defiant. Palladius, writing several centuries after the fact, says that Potamiena was a slave and the rich man who bribed the governor to torture her was her master. If that's true, it adds an extra layer of contemptibility to the rich man's actions, since, as the master, he'd already have plenty of ways to compel Potamiena to do whatever he wanted. Our earlier sources don't say that Potamiena was a slave. If she was a free woman, or even from a good family, it would help to explain why the accusation that she and her mother were Christians, and what happened next, caused such a scandal in the city. The governor had been thinking about what to do with Potamiena. When torture didn't work, he decided to try a different route. He told her that if she did not do as she was told, he would force her to become a prostitute. Potamiena realized she had one last card to play. We don't know exactly what Potamiena said. We do know that it was so offensive to the Roman religion and the Roman state, so treasonous and, by pagan standards, blasphemous, that in a single sentence she changed her legal situation. I imagine everyone in the room holding their breath for a moment. Everyone heard her say it. The governor no longer had any discretion in how she was punished. She would have to die. And so, a Roman officer was selected to escort her to the place where she would be executed. That officer was Basilides. Basilides' job was to get Potamiena from one place to another. To do that, he had to take her through a large crowd. Despite the situation, many in the crowd thought Potamiena was in the wrong. Why not just give in to the rich man? Why insult the pagans and their gods? Basilides, though, had watched the trial and thought the whole thing was disgusting. He didn't think Potamiena deserved the additional humiliation. When the crowd surged forward, he pushed back, putting himself between Potamiena and everyone else and trying to keep her as safe as he could while she was under his care. It's not easy to stand up to a crowd, but Basilides did it. That is what makes him a manly saint. He demonstrated the decency that every condemned person hopes to find in those in charge. That is why today, St. Basilides is the patron saint of prison guards. Potamiena appreciated the kindness of her guard. But when they arrived at the place where Potamiena was to be executed, it was Basilides who got a surprise. Even though she was going to die, Potamiena encouraged Basilides not to be afraid. She told him to cheer up, because where she was going, she would ask the Lord to remember Basilides' kindness. And then, with courage which impressed all of Alexandria, she went to her death. Several days later, Basilides and his men were to perform a routine task which required them to pay allegiance to the gods, perhaps to the statue of the emperor. Basilides told his fellow soldiers that he couldn't do it. He was a Christian. At first they all had a good laugh. Things turned serious when they realized that Basilides wasn't joking. The Roman emperors depended on the military to stay in power. For this reason, they were very careful about punishing soldiers. But Basilides was like a policeman who stands in the middle of the police station and announces that he has joined the mafia. His fellow soldiers had no choice but to arrest him. 
The judge had no choice but to condemn him to die. Before his death, Basilides was held in the prison where all the Christians were kept. It was there that the Christians of Alexandria came to him. They offered Basilides baptism, which he gladly accepted. They were also curious about what had happened. One minute he was guarding Potamiana, and the next he was professing to be a Christian himself. Why? Basilides told the story. The incident with Potamiana had worried him, of course, but he had gotten on with his work. That night, when he slept, he had had a dream. He saw Potamiana, but not the way he remembered her. Now she was glorious, and she came to him and said that her prayers had been successful, and she had something for him. It was a crown, which she put on his head. He woke up from this strange dream and tried to put it out of his mind, but the next night he dreamed the same dream, and then the night after that. By then, Basilides had realized that the crown he was being offered was that of a martyr. That was why, even though he knew he was condemning himself to die, Basilides had proclaimed that he was a Christian. Now that he was in prison, Basilides may well have been having second thoughts, when Origen arrived to speak with him. We don't know what they said to each other, but we have two clues. The first clue is that, years later, the martyr Basilides would be listed as one of the students of Origen. Maybe that means that, as he was trying to understand the meaning of his visions of St. Potamiana, Basilides snuck into the Christian school and listened to Origen speak. Or maybe this just tells us how profoundly Origen affected Basilides while he was in prison. Our other clue comes from Origen's later writings. We don't know what he said to Basilides, but we know what he would have said to a martyr from his surviving exhortation to martyrdom. You are an athlete, writes Origen, to the man facing martyrdom. But when you go into the arena, remember that you too have a crowd cheering for you. Your fellow martyrs are watching. So are the holy angels and even nature itself. Origen heard applause for martyrs in the rustling of the trees. And what comes next? Origen imagines it in terms of the Garden of Eden. Look for the angel with the flaming sword, he tells the prospective martyr. The angel stands at the border of the garden. He stands there to keep out those whose faith is built on a flammable, weak foundation of wood and straw, but you will have passed through the fire of martyrdom, and for you, the angel will stand aside. Walk forward into the garden, past the body of the serpent, its head crushed by the foot of Jesus. Walk in among the trees. There you will find the tree of life.